Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on weird and true mysterious stories, from glitches to the paranormal. Did you know you can support the channel by joining? If you enjoy the videos, it's something to think about. On to the stories. This is my channel's weekly compendium for the week ending Monday, January 23rd, 2023. Case file number 934, written by That's For Me 32, John, the Multiversal Bandit. I was working late one evening at the office. I was the only one left in the building. I work on the third floor and needed to grab something from the fourth floor archive room. I walked up the stairs, I may or may not be deathly afraid of elevators, and as I reached the fourth floor, I saw one of my colleagues, I'll call him John, not his real name, coming out of the archive room. I greeted him and asked him how he was doing. I didn't know he was also going to work late tonight. He said he's fine, burning that midnight oil for a company that doesn't care for him. He's the honest type without much filter, but he does clean work. He carries on, I go into the archive room and pick up a paper receipt, we still keep those as backup, that I needed for a client. Went back downstairs, passing by John's desk on the way back to mine, said hi again and asked what it was he had needed from the archive room. He acted like I was touched in the head and said, is this for a reaction video? Why are you goofing around? I still have a lot of work to do, can't be bothered with this right now. I was taken aback. John isn't the rude type, he's just really honest. Normally a simple question like that he'd just answer. I said, sorry to bother you John, I was just curious on what you wanted to get is all. John responds, well, if you're not kidding, you need to see a shrink because I've been at my desk for the past 5 hours, haven't even gone to the bathroom. Come to think of it, I probably should go pee. John's not the kidding type either. His words were absolute confirmation to me that whatever I had seen was not human, or at least it was something not meant for my eyes to see. Whatever I had spoken to, wait, were we robbed by a lookalike? I don't think anything went missing from the archive room. I never reported this to security because I have enough stress on my plate to deal with and don't need accusations of cuckoo bird thrown on top. I just know there's been no extra security or notice or anything like that since that night. Case fall number 935, written by Sign of Libertas. The Furry Trio of Danger. I was out for a walk. It was late, almost midnight. I love late night walks. Seeing the stars and the moon, the crisp air, it's perfect. Town I live in is safe. So as I'm walking down the sidewalk, midtown, but keep in mind this is a small town. There's no alleyways or anything like that. Small shops and small little roads. I come up to a four-way intersection that's just stop signs, and on my left side, there's a shop's wall near the curb. I see a black cat with white specks on him walk by in front of me. I'm thinking of a silly superstition. <laughs> oh no, black cat passes in front of me. Bad luck, right? But maybe it doesn't count because of the white specks. Phew. <laughs> so a couple seconds after this, I see this cat. Another one that looks identical emerges from behind the corner. I wasn't very far away from the edge of the building, so I could make out the detail on the cat's fur. It looked the same as the first one. Then another cat emerges, the same pattern again. They all look like they were cloned, same shape, weight, appearance. They meander down the street, which thankfully no cars were driving on tonight, then disappeared down the road further to my right. I didn't go after them, I was lost in my mind. I've seen stray cats before, of course, who hasn't? But three that look exactly the same, move the same way, following each other? I don't know, maybe this is an extreme coincidence and not a glitch, but it felt wrong. Didn't stay out on my walk for much longer after this, the walks I take at night are always in a loop to get back home. I decided to jog home just to be safe that night. This happened a while ago, I haven't seen those cats again. Case file number 936, written by 1000 Ways to Live. 10 minutes to 3 hours back. I was driving home from work. It takes about 10 minutes. I've made this trip innumerable times. I could do it blindfolded while sleepwalking with one hand glued inside my mouth. Just to hone the point home, huh? <laughs> I was listening to music and thinking about dinner plans. It was my turn to cook tonight. Sushi, perhaps? 
Hmm, maybe not. I'm starving and it takes forever for the rice to cook and then cool down. As I was thinking this thought, I found myself pulling into my driveway. I parked my car and got out, still on brain autopilot. I walked into my house and shouted, Honey, I'm home! A funny trope I like reversing because I'm the chick who brings home the bacon and my man takes care of the family. It works for us. My husband rushed to the door before I even sat my purse down, exclaiming, Where were you? I told him I had just driven home from work like I usually do. But he looked at me with a mixture of confusion, terror, and a little sprinkle of anger. Then said, Babe, you've been gone for over three hours. I texted you so many times I was about to call the cops. I didn't remember anything out of the ordinary happening during my drive. I hadn't been stuck in traffic, hadn't taken any detours, and I hadn't stopped for anything. As far as I was concerned, I had just been driving for the usual 10 minutes. Hell, if anything, it felt like a slightly faster trip home than usual. I checked my phone and it was indeed 3 hours later than when I had left work. It's past 7 now. I didn't have any messages or calls on my phone. You know the truly most disturbing, mind-ducking part of this? I just got out of my car and walked inside. My eyes still worked, but the memory I have of literally a minute ago was of a normal winter horizon at a bit past 4 p.m., still plenty bright out. When I look out, it's pitch black. Was I possessed or something? I had nothing I could say to my husband to reassure him because I don't know what happened at all. I hope I can convince him because I don't want him to think I'm cheating. What the hell? Case file number 937, written by Turtle Bubbles, Poseidon, Lord of the Ocean and Rings. Two summers ago, my family and I went on a cruise for our summer vacation. It was a great experience, went snorkeling, and just had an awesome bonding time together. I'm the youngest of three siblings, 19 now. During one of the snorkeling trips, my father had lost his wedding ring in the ocean. He didn't think it would come off. I remember seeing how devastated he was over it. That wedding ring was not just a symbol of marriage, but also a sentimental piece that had been passed down to my mom by her mom, my grandmother. It's very distinct. The center stone was a large diamond, not sure how big exactly, but it's gorgeous, and had tiny rubies encrusted in the sides. Never seen one like it before. We searched the area where he thought he lost the ring, but it was nowhere to be found, and it was too dangerous to dive deep anyways. There was no way to get it, even if we could find it. We all had to accept that it was lost forever in the ocean. That severely sullied the rest of the trip, but we did the best we could. I remember my mom consoling my dad, making sure he knew she didn't blame him. They're still together, by the way. I'm so lucky to have them as my parents, they're amazing. Fast forward to today. I was in the living room when I heard my dad shout from upstairs, Honey, babe, Snooky butt, where are you? I found the ring. I heard him say this, but didn't really understand what he was talking about. In my mind, that wedding ring might as well be on the moon, and I know my dad didn't lose the replacement they eventually bought together. It was nice, but nothing compared to the antique that was in Poseidon's grasp now so there was no ring lost to be found in my mind. Still, I was interested to know what he was on about, so I skipped upstairs. There, in my parents' ensuite bathroom, my dad was holding the antique diamond-centered ruby-encrusted wedding ring for my grandma. They weren't talking, just staring at it like the beginnings of modern Lord of the Rings, and now I was too. What the freaking ducking bubbles, frick? That's about as accurate a recreation of the words that came out of my mouth at the time, and still all I can say, all any of us can say about this. It's a damn miracle. That's all there is to it. Because the only reasonable explanation is that someone scuba dived hundreds of feet below the ocean, found a beautiful antique ring, tracked down its owner, us, somehow, broke in and left it in my parents' bathroom sink. Nah, no freaking way. Either it's an act of God or angels, or we've all gone mad. No matter the answer, we're all happy as beavers now. Case file number 938, written by DunBB2, Cupid, the Lord of Love, and Lingerie. I was at the mall the other day, shopping for some new lingerie. As I was walking through the store, 
I noticed a couple browsing the racks nearby. They were both around my age and seemed happy and content together. You know the standard lovey-dovey type? More PDA than I like, but hey, more power to them. I couldn't help but overhear their conversation as they were discussing what to buy and looking at clothes. I was too engrossed in their conversation, to be honest. I was the creep of their story. Hopefully my cuteness overwhelmed the weird factor. I really needed to use the bathroom, so I pulled myself away for that. When I came back, I looked for the couple again, but the boyfriend was gone. I didn't think much of it. I assumed he had probably gone to the bathroom too, or another store. But when I walked closer to the woman, I noticed that she was acting as if he never existed. She was alone, and no one was with her. None of my business, really, I know. But I asked the woman if everything was okay, and she looked at me confused. I said, Okay, don't hate me, but I was listening in to your conversation earlier, with your boyfriend, I assume. She said she'd been here alone the whole time and had no idea what I was talking about. The way she said it, I just knew she wasn't trying to lie to me or kid around or anything like that. So I apologized to her and went to the register to check out. I found a very cute set of underwear with stripes and hearts matching. I asked the lady at the register, because I'm just too damn curious and nosy, if she had noticed the girl over by the, um, Women's Electric Wonderland section. If she had come in with a man... The girl gave me the side eye and said she wasn't paying attention to that. I can take a hint. I'm too much, aren't I? But it just feels so odd. I know she was with a man. They were talking with each other for at least five minutes. And there were no male employees in the store. Not the type of conversation to have with one anyways. Bonus file. Written by This Is The Way 42. Haunted House Jitters. All in white. In my hometown... There's a house that's famous for being haunted. It is an old Victorian house that has been abandoned for many years, but it's technically not illegal to go into, or at least no one has been caught or charged with trespassing. Locals have all kinds of stories about the place. A lot of people will camp outside near it for the thrill, and usually hear weird noises coming from inside, usually in the kitchen area, which you can see from the road. One summer, my friends and I decided to check out the house ourselves. Our parents always forbade us to go there, so naturally, as rebellious dumb teenagers, that made us absolutely have to go. Oh, to be a dumb kid again. <sighs> we had to see if the stories were true for ourselves. We went in the middle of the night and started exploring. We didn't even drive yet, so we took our bikes. It seemed normal at first, but just as we were about to leave, we heard voices from upstairs. We had already explored there. At least, we were pretty sure they were voices. To be honest, we still didn't really believe anything supernatural was going on, even up to this point of hearing something upstairs. We walked, very cautiously, to the second floor, and when we reached the top of the stairs, we saw a figure standing at the end of the corridor. It was a woman in a long white dress. We were just truly petrified. Did one of our friends from school beat us here just to scare us? We had told our squad about it, but didn't say we were going tonight. Hell, we didn't even know until we summoned up the courage to. After speaking, the figure disappeared. Not in front of us. She walked into the room to her right. We instantly ran out of the house. I even tripped on the bottom step and bit my lip somehow from the fall. When we got outside... We looked back at the home expecting to see the girl looking out from the window. The room she went into was facing the road. But we didn't see anything. We weren't waiting around, that's for sure. Case fall number 939, written by Simple Husky 1, the Lord of Storms and Glitches. I was on a drive up north, alone, exploring the country. I tried to take at least two trips a year. You never know what you'll see when you get out there and really look. It was a beautiful day. The sky was a clear, pristine blue. I had been on the road for a few hours when suddenly, a violent storm rolled out of nowhere. The sky turned dark and the wind was so strong that it was difficult to keep my car on the road. I've been in plenty of storms before, but this one came on so quickly, within a few minutes of seeing dark clouds on the horizon. It was too dangerous to keep driving, so I decided to pull off the road and wait for the storm to pass. I found a small rest area and parked my car. I waited inside for the storm to pass, watching as the rain and hail battered against my windshield. 
I'm surprised it held together so well. A few dents in the side panel and the driver's side door, that's all. They make car glass pretty damn tough. The storm lasted for about an hour, and when it finally passed, I continued on my way. When I got to my hotel later that night, I looked up the AccuWeather app and wanted to see what they were saying about the storm I had just passed through, just a couple hours ago by this point. But they had reported no such storm. I checked on my laptop, googled it, tried multiple weather sites. None of them had reported a storm at all in the area I'd passed through. It wasn't very late. I try never to drive at night because I can't handle the absurdly bright headlights that all cars seem to have now. It gives me headaches. I went back outside to my car to check to see if the couple dents on the side panel and hood were still there. They were. So what's going on here? My mind and my car is evidence of the storm, but I can't find any info on it anywhere. Creepy File Number 75, written by Anonymous. The Summer Camp of Terror. One summer, I was working as a camp counselor at a remote summer camp deep in the Adirondack woods. It was my first year working at the camp and I was excited to spend the summer in nature and help guide the children through different activities. To be honest, I was surprised I snagged up the job. I'm not exactly Bear Grylls. First few weeks went by smoothly. The children were having a great time. My camp co-workers were not bothered by my inexperience. Turnover rate is high, so it's expected. But as the weeks went by, there were a few odd things. I would often hear noises at night, like footsteps outside my cabin, even though I knew that everyone else was asleep. Also, things would randomly go missing. Since it was part of my job to ensure that the kids were safe and actually sleeping, I'd do the rounds once at midnight before hitting the hay myself. These noises made me feel unsafe. They were not animal sounds, but I never saw anyone out of place. Until one night, I was sitting outside my cabin, enjoying the peace and quiet of the woods, except for the mating call of the katydids, when I saw two people moving in the distance, clouded in shadows as the moon was barely out. I assumed it was one of my other counselors taking a late night stroll with Mandy, one of the few female camp workers. But as I got a better look, I saw that it wasn't my co-workers at all. There was a man, he was tall and lanky, at least six foot, wearing torn jeans and a shirt three sizes too big for him, and exuded a creepy as frick vibe. Besides him was a woman, small as a squirrel. She looked emaciated and lost, is the best I can say. They bolted from the tree line towards me. As they reached the cabin porch, they just stood there, looking down at me. The man bent slightly at the knees, but being so tall, he still towered over me sitting in my rocking chair. The woman, a few feet away, in front, but not on the porch. Every thought in my brain said, What the frick are you doing, Becky? Freaking run now or scream or do something! But I couldn't move. I guess I know myself a bit better since this happened. That whole fight or flight thing, there's also paralyzed. The man spoke in barely comprehensible gibberish, at a syllable rate that broke the speed of sound and made Eminem cry. It didn't help that my body was flush with adrenaline, Still, to this day, I can't tell you what he said. All I know is that as he was talking, my legs finally decided to work. I never ran so fast towards the adjacent cabin. To my surprise, the man didn't chase me. The tiny woman did. She was fast and had a look of feralness, if that's even a word. But I made it to the cabin next to mine, which is where the camp leader slept, and did some other administrative work. It was locked, but my voice was back. I was screaming at the top of my lungs the whole sprint and banging on the door. I think they got scared as soon as they saw the lights in the cabin turn on. No idea how close the woman got to me, because I never looked back. I told everyone everything, and no one was surprised. A few co-workers said they thought they had seen people creeping nearby the camp. And keep in mind, there are a few defenses for the camp, because so many kids are here. No actual security guards, but there is a perimeter fence that's supposed to have camera coverage. But it's a massive camp, so gaps I'm sure exist. I've had to train my brain to feel safe again. To allow itself to feel safe again. It doesn't want to listen. I always carry pepper spray with me now. Better safe than sorry, right? Case file number 940, written by K. Hammer. The Instantaneous Road Trip. Several years ago, 
I attended a concert in Cincinnati, Ohio with two friends. We are from southern Indiana, so we drove from where we lived, through Kentucky, into Ohio on our route. After the concert, we loaded up to make the trip home. I rode in the back seat while Liz drove and Victoria sat in the front passenger side. The concert ended around midnight and the drive home took about three and a half hours. Sometime before we even made it out of Ohio, I fell asleep in the back seat. Next thing I remember is waking up in Liz's back seat and looking around to kind of get my bearings. I immediately noticed that we were on a gravel road. There weren't any gravel roads anywhere on our route, so I asked. Hey guys, where are we? To which they both replied, I don't know, I just woke up. Needless to say, upon hearing this, we both asked Liz again. She said she had no idea where we were. She had no memory of driving or falling asleep. She just knows that all of a sudden, she was awake and we were here. Mind you, she is still driving. We had no idea what state we were even in at this point. And of course it's then we notice the gas gauge is very, very low. After driving aimlessly for several minutes, we saw a small green sign that welcomed us to the town of Johnson. At first it didn't click. Then I remember there was a tiny town by that name about 15 to 20 miles from the town I lived in. Then I noticed a radio tower in the distance to our right. I said that if we were in the town Johnson, the one that was near my hometown, that means the major highway we needed was where that radio tower is. We needed to head in that direction. Well, thank God I was right, because about 20 minutes later we rolled into a gas station just in time. Somehow, we had made the entire three and a half hour drive across three states, then drove 20 miles past our exit off the interstate and exited God knows where to have ended up on the middle of nowhere on a gravel road. The area we were in when we all came to was not a direct route off the interstate. Several turns had to be made to get there. Liz swears to this day she has no memory of what happened, and I believe her simply because of the look of absolute disbelief on her face that night is permanently burned into my memory. We just don't know. Case file number 941, written by Anonymous. An onslaught of key glitches. My husband and I lived in Salt Lake City, Utah, when this happened. We were traveling to Price, Utah, to his aunt's house to pick up his truck. While we are driving, we realized we can't find the truck keys. I was in my early 20s and being a dumb butt, so I had grabbed a 24 ounce can of beer while we were getting gas. I grabbed a cup for fountain drinks and poured my beer into it. We had said a prayer to help us find the truck key, and as I'm talking to him and drinking, I look down and in my cup of beer is the truck key. I have no idea how that could happen. I remember reaching in and the feeling of beer around my hand as I reached in to grab it. We were both dumbfounded. Still is everything I think about. Another glitch, probably two or three years later. I'm staying with my mom and she let my friend and I use her car because it was better on gas than my pickup. Anyway, when we get back, I put the keys in my purse and go to lock the doors, but upon realizing one of the windows was down, I go to turn the car back on so I can roll it up but I can't find my keys anywhere. My friend is searching, I'm searching, and I dump my purse out multiple times with no keys. I go get my mom, who is pissed now because she doesn't want her car sitting out there with windows down. We search the car, search each other, no keys. Finally, after much frustration, we just give up. The next morning, my mom is still upset about the keys and I don't know why, but it just felt like a reset. Like I can't explain it, but I either reached into my purse or dumped it out. And there they were, the keys, right where I remembered putting them and searching yesterday, multiple times. My mom looked relieved but skeptical, and I was just again dumbfounded. I only now realize I had two bizarre stories pertaining to keys. Interesting, isn't it? Case file number 942, written by Popped Light. Glitch on the Cob. I live alone, so the house was quiet and empty. I decided to make myself something to eat, so I walked into the kitchen to check what I had in the fridge. Not much. Had some salami, though. I rarely keep that much around. It's a bad habit, I know. But my New Year's resolution was to eat cleaner. I tried to be realistic about it, too. Not lose 100 pounds in a couple months. No. Instead, to stop uber-eating every single night out. As I opened the door, there was a large bag of corn 
sitting on the top of the shelves. I was very confused. Actually, confused isn't even strong enough of a word. I had never bought corn before in my entire life. Literally never. And I mean not even canned corn. I've eaten it before in a few restaurants and growing up at home with my mom, but never bought and cooked it myself. I thought maybe I had somehow accidentally picked it up at a grocery store, but I just knew I hadn't. This is corn on the cob, raw, leaves and everything still protruding on it. Obviously no one broke into my apartment, on the 8th floor of a 20 floor building, to store their illicit stash of corn here, right? So how do I find corn in my fridge? Did I sleepwalk to the store and buy corn and bring it back here last night? There's no charge on my card and I don't use cash. I got nothing. But something tells me I should not eat this corn. Maybe I'd transform into something inhuman if I did. Case file number 943, written by The Last Avatar 2, Ellie, the Master Enchantress. I return home from work at around 10 p.m. I work at a restaurant, line cook, although I do actual cooking too during rush hour. Always working overtime. Got home, thirsty, so I got a cup of cold water from the fridge, then went upstairs to take a shower. All the lights were off, by the way. I live with my girlfriend, no kids or pets. Our master bedroom is upstairs, two-floor home. Downstairs to the left of the entrance is the living room, with the couch pushed up to the far end of the wall which is extended further back from the entrance, so you can't see the couch when you initially enter the home, unless you go looking for it across the side. Now, as I'm heading back from the kitchen, I see my girlfriend, Ellie, in the dark, browsing through her phone while sitting on the couch. I thought it was odd. Bad for her eyes to be on the phone, especially with the light so bright off of it, she didn't say a single word as I came in. She must be upstairs, I was thinking as I walked towards the kitchen for that cup of water a few minutes ago. After seeing her on the couch, I said, Huh, honey, are you okay? Why are you just sitting there in the pitch black? She looks up and responds, I'm just bored out of my mind and getting tired. I'll be up in a minute, babe, it's okay. She seemed sad, but insisted she was okay. So I went upstairs and took a very needed shower. If humans have an aura, mine was currently stink. After I finish up my shower, I put on some PJs and get ready for bed. I had already eaten at work just a burger and was so mentally drained there was nothing else I wanted to do but hit the hay and dream away the day's problems. Our bathroom is directly connected to our bedroom. I didn't want to take very long there since my girlfriend looked to be tired. My impression was that she'd be conked out by the time I was done with my shower. I head into the bedroom, but my girlfriend isn't in bed. She's still not upstairs. I call out to her from the railing of the top step, but get no response. Really weird. At this point I start to get chills and not from being a little damp from the shower. The air felt wrong. I was in two minds at this point. I didn't want to go downstairs, like at all. Not even a little bit. But I knew I had to. What if my mind was playing tricks on me or my girlfriend was hurt? I pushed through the what I thought had to be totally irrational fear and went downstairs. I turned all the lights on and looked everywhere for my girlfriend. She wasn't there at all, not anywhere in our home. At this point, my mind is racing and thinking all kinds of weird thoughts like, did she just decide to leave me? She must be hurt somewhere. All I could do was call her phone and she picked up after only three rings. This is what makes no goddamn sense. She wasn't here at all, never was. Her mother, who lives in the same suburb area as us, about 15 minutes away, wasn't feeling very well, lightheaded, cold. As soon as she got the call from her, she tore rubber over there and had been there since, over three hours by this point. It was about 10.40 now. Is my girlfriend just lying? Cheating on me? But that doesn't add up either, because I saw her on the couch, on her phone. And I know my, hopefully, future mother-in-law has been having some health problems, so that's true. She has a weak heart, they say. I just need to sit down. Now I'm the one who feels sick. Case file number 944, written by Nachos Inferno XX, The Orb of Purity. Hey there, I am female, 23. I was taking a walk in my secure neighborhood. It was night, but I have a leashed pit bull with me always, my jacked hulky, and gentle, shh, don't tell anyone, guardian, Max, 
clear sky, stars had a little twinkle. As I was walking, I saw a blue shimmer in the distance. Remember, this is a proper residential neighborhood, and gated too. At first, I thought it was a streetlight that had a bad bulb or maybe was switched for one of those terrible white LEDs, but as I got closer, I could see it was a floating ball or orb. It had a blue hue, slightly white towards the middle. The ball of light was about the size of a baseball, I think. It wasn't getting very close to it, almost a street length away. It seemed to be moving at a steady but very slow pace. Even from this far away, I could hear a humming noise, buzzing sound. I don't know if my mind was just fascinated by what I was seeing, or there was something supernatural going on with it, but I just couldn't look away. Does anyone else get that feeling when you look into a candle flame or a campfire? It's similar to that, you just have to keep staring. Also, I'd bet it was raising the temperature of the air by a few degrees at least. I had been rather cool a few minutes ago, and now I could take my coat off and still be relatively comfortable. Max wasn't reacting much to this orb thing. He clearly did see it, but wasn't trying to pull ahead to get to it or bark. He is a good boy, but I don't think he understood what he was seeing was extraordinary. Eventually, the ball stopped moving when it reached a patch of grass. Not in someone's yard, but on the side of the street. It hovered there for a few minutes and then slowly dissipated shrinking and emitting less light, heat, and noise. Then it was gone. After it faded away, I took a chance to approach where it had been. I didn't see any evidence it had ever been there. I thought there'd be scorch marks on the grass patch at least, but it all looked completely normal. That was the end to a strange night. But when I got home, I was too curious. I googled blue orb encounters, and there are tons of stories about this. People call it ball lightning, but there are others that think it's charged spiritual energy. I have no clue myself, but it was really cool to see. It felt good. Anyone else experience a spiritual ball lightning? Case notes are file 934. John, the Multiversal Bandit. And here, ladies and gentlemen, we have Oceans 15. Sadly, George Clooney decided not to reprise his role, so a new character has to be created, and thankfully, Brad Pitt has agreed to play the part of John. In all seriousness, the vibe I get from this is that John is kind of fed up working in that corporation, and there might be some corporate espionage going on. Given your line of questioning, I'm assuming it wasn't really normal for John to go into the archive room, so whatever he got there probably was related to something he wasn't supposed to have. I don't think he physically stole anything, like any documents or receipts, rather taking pictures instead, trying to give a picture to competitors and how the corporation is doing financially. Even though there's camera footage, you don't have access to it, but the higher ups would. If you didn't report it though, they may not actually know anything's wrong. If he's a very trusted person with a high access level, maybe it's not on the radar. I think eventually it will be. The question though is, you passed by his desk, so was he just completely lying about the whole thing and he did see you and he's just making up something to make you think that you're going crazy? Or were you seeing into another universe when you saw him stealing, or maybe stealing, when you passed him, he was at, actually at his desk, you just didn't see him because you were seeing into a different universe. That's a pretty cool thought. You were witnessing a crime, but not in this universe. Hmm. That would be difficult to report. Case notes are file 935, The Furry Trio of Danger. Hey, so I wonder if anything weird happened after seeing these cats. So in the Matrix movies, of course, it's the classic glitch where Neo sees the black cat walk up the stairs and then sees it again exactly the same way, same cat, same movement. However, he didn't see two cats at the same time, just a repeat of the, you know, a deja vu event. Did they just randomly make that up or were the Wachowski brothers onto something? Did they have an idea that, yeah, if there's some sort of change in the universe, in the simulation, does that mean that there's a sign somewhere that something was altered? Like now, if you try to change computer code in any way, you change one program and a hundred other things go wrong because it, it's, it's all interconnected. So it's hard to make isolated changes. I have no idea how the simulation works or is programmed in the real world, if indeed we do live in a simulation. I wonder, do you guys believe we live in a simulation? Are you as convinced as I am? And if so, what do you think the real world is like? Do you think we're all in a pod being harvested by computers for our intelligence? And actually, that was the premise of the Matrix movies, not as batteries, which makes no sense. It would take more energy to grow the food and to 
sustain us than that we provide. Uh, the original concept was to use our mental capacity to f- fuel a uh, advanced computer, I guess, which makes some sense, versus batteries. But they thought that the audience wouldn't understand that. They would uh, lose people. So they just went with batteries, which everyone understands. You know, this was the late 90s. Not many people had the idea of what computers were. So I understand why they thought it would lose people. But yeah, what do you think the real world is like? I hope it's impossible to get fat and you can just eat all the time. So basically heaven. Yeah. Case notes are file 936. 10 minutes to 3 hours back. So damn, the time loss itself is glitchy. But then tack on the fact that you remember walking out of your car. It was normal light out on a winter day. Obviously, it's setting early, but at 4, 4 ish, somewhere into 4, there's still some light. Plenty enough to notice there's still, you know, a blue sky and everything. The sun is probably around setting at that point, close to. But then you look behind you after your husband tells you you've been gone for three hours and it's pitch black. Well, either your mind invented that memory or. You were abducted in your own driveway by aliens, presumably. It could be a time anomaly, space-time warping anomaly, but usually those happen while driving. You're moving through more space, so the odds greatly increase. If it was right in your driveway, unless the anomaly also moves, I mean, it would happen frequently, not just this one-off event. My guess would be aliens, which is kind of cool. You know, I actually saw a Twitter video. I don't know if it's real, of course. you With the deep fakes these days, you can't really know for sure. But it looked pretty convincing. It seemed like ring camera footage of someone's driveway. And the man walked out, went to the left of the camera, and was abducted sort of like off screen. There was a tiny sliver of him that you could still see. And he just zapped away. And I don't know what happened. There was no follow up to this. I guess the concept makes sense somehow to abduct people just as they're leaving their home. So yeah, you drove home normally, got out of your car. And in that exact moment, you were abducted. And then brought back. There's a seamless transition in that where the aliens have something to do with it to suppress the memory. Then you just walk in and you don't realize, yeah, it's already dark. You were gone for three hours. It's wild. I hope uh, your husband does believe you or something because, yeah, it's unfair for you to be accused or thought of as cheating just because of this crazy event. I think this all fits pretty well, especially if your home is more remote. Case notes are file 937. Poseidon, the lord of the ocean. And of rings. I think this might just be the most amazing DOP story I've ever narrated and read in general. I don't narrate every single story I read, but indeed there is no rational explanation within the realm of the normal that I can think of. Because if the ring was lost in the ocean, merely finding it, just the odds that someone randomly scuba dives in the location where your father lost it while snorkeling, which is kind of fun by the way. Wouldn't want to go scuba diving. I'm afraid of Delta P. I can't imagine how terrible that would have been. But then to find it again in your sink, there's no logical way I can square that besides saying it de rendered and reappeared there. Or to me, this strikes me more as some will. I don't know if it was God. I don't know if it was an angel. I don't know if it was a spirit that just felt the pain and went out and literally scoured the ocean to find it. Maybe it was a loved one that passed away and wanted to do something nice for you. Maybe your grandma, even. That's an interesting thought kind of nice, really. But yeah, your family sounds so pure, and I'm very happy for you little beavers. Case notes for file 938. Cupid, the lord of love and of lingerie. So yes, I would agree that you are maybe a bit too uh, nosy and curious for your own good. Didn't you hear that curiosity killed the cat? All nine lives. I I advise some caution. Refrain yourself. Certainly from making it obvious. Be incognito if you're going to do that. I would say there are some normal explanations for this. Maybe the girl broke up with her boyfriend on the spot for some reason. Maybe he was picking out a lingerie that she really didn't like or something. And because of the friction, she just wanted to act like, you know, he was gone and she didn't care. Sometimes people turtle up in a shell after uh, an emotional hardship. Or maybe there was a male employee that was trying really hard to make a sale. (laughs) I don't know. Some salesmen are very aggressive. If it was a glitch, then it could just be multiversal love peering. Let's call it that. So you just saw in another universe where the girl was there with her boyfriend and then came back from the bathroom and he wasn't there anymore because it's your original universe where she is sadly alone. Maybe Cupid will strike soon, hopefully, before Valentine's Day. A multiversal peep show. Oh my. What am I doing? (laughs) Case notes for the bonus file. The jittery haunted house. All in white. So yeah, I've been there before. The uh, adventurous, mischievous, slightly mischievous spirit of youth. 
for me, was never uh, exploring abandoned locations or mines or caves or stuff like that, or haunted homes. It was just climbing trees I shouldn't have been. Spend all day climbing trees, left and right, and falling out of them, breaking... I didn't really break any bones. I got a lot of scratches, though. I don't know how I didn't break more bones. <laughs> Maybe I'm Wolverine or something. And uh, I may or may not still climb trees as a 32-year-old grown man. I just say that I'm doing pull-ups, so it doesn't seem too odd. It's the uh, adult version of climbing trees. Regarding the story, it's very true that there are haunted homes all over the place. But haunted doesn't necessarily mean evil or bad. People conflate the term haunting with evil presence or malevolence. But no, it just means that uh, there's, it's a location where there's a spirit tied to it or multiple spirits. They could be pleasant spirits or just neutral. The woman seems like she was lonely or longing for something. Maybe just wanted company. From my impression, of course you were a teenager so you'd be terrified out of your mind. I still would be even as a, an adult. But I don't think that she had any ill will towards you. Make of that what you will. Still, yeah, overall I'd say most places that are haunted are positive. Because I think most people deep down are good people. And when you die, the leftover imprint, the soul that you leave behind, the piece of it, is a reflection of who you were. The real you. Your actions. Who you choose to be. And I think most people end up choosing to be pretty good people. So... The fragments of their soul left behind would reflect that. Maybe I'm just an optimist. Doesn't mean there are no bad spirits, but the bulk of them probably are good. Case notes for file 939. The Lord of Storms and Glitches. So I was curious about this too, and apparently there is a phenomenon, a real meteorological phenomena, called popcorn thunderstorms, where bursts of cool air can rush into a humid environment, and this can create very quick, sudden thunderstorm clouds. Usually they're microbursts, they don't last very long, minutes, not hours. Uh, you say that yours lasted about an hour? So I guess it's on the high end of the uh, extreme, but it could be that. It's just odd that no weather service would pick it up. I mean, they all have radar tracking, so they should be able to tell a storm. And there should be in some sort of notice about it in the past, I think. And we know it's not a crossover event, because damage to your car persisted. So whatever happened really happened in your universe. Maybe it was Zeus paying you a visit or saying, be on your best behavior. Also, I know exactly what you mean about those damn headlights. I don't know what's going on there. Well, I actually do. I looked it up. <laughs> There's a car lumen intensity, the amount of photons emitted, basically, the energy. It's also shifted more to blue light, which can cause headaches. For me, it does. I have to wear sunglasses outside and during the day or I get migraines. But yeah, there's uh, more lumens in headlights now on average, like three to 4,000 versus one to 2,000 20 years ago. And back then, it was more orange-white light instead of the blue light now, which is just piercing. There is some good news, though. You can actually buy driving glasses. They have a yellowish tint, and they block out a lot of blue light and also diminish the glare from the headlights. So it's much easier to drive at night when without getting a headache or anything. And you still can see everything. They're not sunglasses. They're made specifically for driving at night. Look them up uh, on Amazon. There's plenty of options. Driving glasses. If car headlights bother you too. Case notes for creepy file number 75, The Summer Camp of Terror. Well, you're damn right, it's better safe than sorry. You don't want to take risks where they're not necessary, unless you're a daredevil like me. <laughs> but yeah, especially as a woman, I would say, you know, take precautions, at least have pepper spray, that's a good, uh, good option. Although I think pepper spray or tasers don't work on people who are uh, high on mind-altering substances, so maybe carry something a bit more intense, if it's possible in your area. I really do hope you're able to reclaim that sense of peace that everyone should have. At least it didn't break into your home. Like in the summer camp, it's still, you're supposed to feel safe there, but when someone invades someone's home, it's hard to reclaim what was lost there because you can never feel safe again unless you go to extreme paranoid levels like having uh, steel reinforced doors and bulletproof glass. I might do that myself because I want to have a small little cabin, not much space, so it wouldn't be too expensive to do. But yeah, you want to you wanna feel secure. There's nothing wrong with that. There's also nothing wrong with the fact that you were initially paralyzed. That happens to a lot of people. Fight or flight or paralyzed. People don't mention the third one. A lot of people just freeze up. So don't feel bad about that. You eventually regained your senses and ran off. So well done. I hope things go well for you from now on. Case notes for the file 940. The instantaneous trip. I think it's all in that detail about the gas cage being low. I think you mentioned this because it wasn't low before leaving, obviously, being full for a long road trip. But to me, this indicates that there was actually driving going on, but the memory was blocked out. 
I think it rules out alien abduction or space-time portals, wormholes, because then the car wouldn't have driven enough to have a low gas tank. Something physically caused everyone in the car, you were asleep, but Liz and Victoria, I believe was the name, uh, they both lost memory as well. It is possible, by the way, to drive on autopilot based on pure instinct. People uh, do this all the time where they reach their destination and they don't remember how they got there. But the fact it happened to everyone in the car, off trail in some gravel road that wasn't connected on the route anyways, something influenced that. Maybe a spirit? A mass possession? I can't say for sure, I can only rule out, sadly, alien abductions. Unless the aliens also drain fuel from the car, which I guess they could. They'd have to be pretty bright creatures to reach here at all. Case notes are file 941, an onslaught of keyed glitches. You know, over time as I read enough stories, and I don't narrate every single story I read, there are just so many, I notice patterns emerging over weeks. Some weeks it's a lot of cat stories, some weeks it's a lot of dog stories or time anomalies. This week there were more key based glitches or doors involving locks. I don't know if it means anything, it's just an interesting observation. Humans are very good at noticing patterns, so it may just be my mind seeing faces in the, the clouds. But if it does mean something, maybe it's related to the people posting it. Because there are so many glitches happening, and of course, not all of them are posted. In fact, I would guess the majority are ignored by people that they happen to. Because they're too small and they're just dismissed as aberrations of the mind. People don't know about Reddit and they don't know about my channel or other channels like it where they can send stories, so they just don't know where to share it. Maybe they tell a friend, but that's it. So it's pretty cool to just have this platform where people can share their events, their weird anomalies. And yeah, we can uh, sit around and think about what the hell's going on. DOP is probably the most common glitch, I would say. And especially when items return out of place in different locations, it's just weird. Still the most striking one for me was the ruby encrusted diamond antique wedding ring coming back two years later from uh, being lost in the ocean. That's just incredible. Keys appearing in beer drinks is... Uh, very odd too, even though it wasn't that long between disappearing and reappearing. Case notes for file 942. A glitch on the cob. I don't think you have to fear the uh, corn on the cob that's mysteriously in your fridge now. <laughs> I don't think you'll become some transhuman monster if you uh, consume it. That said, it is weird that it just showed up there, especially given that you never buy corn. Which, to me, is weird in of itself, because corn is amazing. Usually I just buy canned corn as a snack or maybe a side dish. It's tasty, it's low in calories, relatively speaking. In summertime, when it's cheap, just buy corn on the cob, grill it up, it's amazing. Or you can just boil it too, that works as well. Just add a little bit of salt and pepper, and a little bit of butter. I think people way over butter their corn on the cob, usually. You don't need much, just need enough to coat it, and enable that flavor transfer process, that's all. Do you want some corn with your butter? <laughs> or a video of um, Gordon Ramsay making mashed potatoes where he adds more butter than mashed potato. Like, okay, calm down, buddy. Calm down, Frenchman. I guess, no, Gordon Ramsay isn't French, right? He's just a Brit. So I guess the French are safe. Hmm, c'est bon. As to the glitch, uh, most likely simple explanation. In one universe, the corn that you bought, in that universe you like corn, I guess, just disappeared from the fridge, it reappeared in your universe. That transfer process seems to happen pretty frequently, especially lately. So people will just be receiving things that they did procure in their universe in another one, and it just moved over here for some reason. I wish I knew why. How does that happen? Is there some uh, space-time uh, wormhole anomaly that enables multiversal travel? Seems to be the case, because we don't just move universes purely from quantum immortality. That's just the soul. Physical matter itself does move between universes as well. Case notes for file 943. Ellie, the master enchantress. I don't think Ellie is cheating on you, and I think this is actually a very easy explanation. There are two I can think of. It's pretty easy for us, at least we've been submerged into the realm of the supernatural or glitchy for so long. It all comes natural to us now, explaining away these very strange things to normal people. The first possibility is that Ellie was in a different universe. You were simply seeing into that universe of the many in the multiverse, and in that universe Ellie was just on the couch at home. Her mother was fine, or at least in that moment was fine. She probably had the lights on over there, but you weren't seeing that, those photons weren't transmitted over. Only Ellie. And you may even have noticed that Ellie was brighter than her surroundings would indicate if she was sitting in the dark. You do mention something about brightness? Maybe just talking about her phone? 
The other possibility is that this was astral projection, and we had another account of this not too long ago where there was a grandma that was over at the neighbor's house and she had fallen over over there, wasn't too hurt, but then the person that story was told from, the perspective, they came home, found their grandma in the bedroom on the floor, laying down, seemingly in some type of pain, and then they just vanished and the grandma came over eventually and she was wearing the same thing. Almost certainly astral projection, a sort of a defense mechanism of the soul, I would say. If something happens to you, especially in an older age, you'd want people to know. And what better way to do it is to project your soul out to someone who could maybe help. I think in this case it wasn't a defense mechanism for her body. I mean, your girlfriend was fine. Physically, just emotionally drained. She seemed sad. I think that fits probably the best as astral projection, but both universal peering or astral projection fit pretty well here. I don't think cheating at all is involved. Okay, so let's file 944. The Orb of Purity. Yeah, so this is actually indeed just ball lightning, like your research told you. It's one of my favorite glitches because it's a mainstream mystery. There could be physical properties involved, like we wouldn't say that lightning is a glitch because it's so frequent and we understand it fairly well. It's just a static charge that builds up between the water particles and the clouds in the atmosphere. It's like if you go rub your feet on carpet and then touch a metal surface, the extra electrons in your body will flood over to that conductive element and you'll feel a static charge very briefly. Well, that's lightning outbursts. There's different types. There's actually quite a few types. And ball lightning is the rarest form. Now that said, there are many mysteries revolving around it. One of the main ones is people have seen ball lightning cross through glass panels like it doesn't even exist, which shouldn't be possible because glass isn't conductive at all. So it should be blocked by physical surfaces like that. If it was just an electrified charged ball in the atmosphere, it should be blocked by those surfaces. Also the fact that there is no scorch marks at all on the pavement, on the grass especially, you said that it was emitting heat. So you would think that the, the grass would be affected. There would be some evidence that there was ball lightning around. So maybe there is a real phenomena of ball lightning, but maybe there's a mixture as well. Maybe there are spiritual energy, I guess the fragments of souls that aren't fully materialized or coalesced into this universe yet, and they're just roaming about. Maybe they even merge with ball lightning. They blend together into this stream of energy, and people report often that ball lightning has a stream behind it, almost like a comet. And if it was just a static energy buildup, you could rub your feet on carpet long enough and eventually just kamehameha, blue orb of energy around. I don't think anyone's been able to do that. We'd know uh, with the monk and the Shaolin temples. That's not a thing yet. Hopefully someday. I do think there is a spiritual property to this. And the main instinct that tells me that is just how people describe seeing this as usually a positive, like the warm feeling you, you said. So it's probably more than just a static ball of electricity. 